Madison and Macy Holmes are our next speakers. Now, Madison's the founding member of Over the Youth, a community of conscious individuals with a shared vision of creating a harmonious world with meaningful, soulful, and resilient relationships between each other and our environment. Her sister Macy is a member of Over the Youth and a regular contributor to their podcasts, which I invite you to check out. Uh, it's a community platform for publishing content created by and for youth members. Help me welcome Madison and Macy Holmes. I believe that is an HD mic cord. That is fine. The show must go on. <laughs> so before we begin, I want to say thank you, not only to the Uni We Unify team for, is there an issue with the mic? Maybe there's adapter. Okay, Apple. Um, Thank you, though. <laughs> okay, we are hell bent on getting this up. <laughs> There's two sides. And sometimes we fail anyway. <laughs> okay, thank you for having us, the We Unify team for putting this on. And, okay. And for everybody that bought a ticket to be here today. And I also wanna thank our Alberta community back home because it wasn't for them, we would not be here because it wasn't in our fiscal ability. I'd like to begin with a quote, Matthew 7, 8. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Today, I ask you receive me. Together we have been seeking, thus we are finding, and I am at your doors now because something has been found. So may this knock notify you to open. Now to begin, it was suggested we give a bit of personal history for those who don't know who we are. I had some baby photos for you. <laughs> but since we only have 15 minutes, we'll skip ahead. If you haven't caught on yet, the first solution to reclaiming Canada is a sense of humor. <laughs> now for the personal history side of things, when Jonathan, one of the We Unified team members, came to us from our Over to the Youth podcast, he said, what did your parents do to make you this way? And that's a fair question. What is it that made me and Macy not just care about the world around us beyond ourselves, but actually pursue the knowledge to get involved and understand it? It started with family. We weren't awake before COVID. We ate bad food, didn't think Big Pharma was actively trying to kill us, more or less didn't mind the government, but we weren't politically or more importantly, socially active. We didn't know the world, but we knew people, and more importantly, we wanted to know one another. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> our parents earned our trust and respect because they never hid their fear when confronted with hard challenges. They've always demonstrated a willingness to work things out together, even if it was on the fly. Like in Captain America when Tony asked Steve, and if we lose, Tony, Cap just said, then we'll do that together too. I remember one time when we were in the car, our dad said, if anything goes wrong, the first person you should look to is yourself. Um, <laughs> this taught me a great deal about taking responsibility for my own actions. 
They were willing to help me along the way, but the responsibility was and is always my own. The reason I listened to my parents is because they would provide their own context of what it was like for them growing up and would point out the behavioral observations they made about themselves and others and over time through non-stop conversations about why people do what they do. I began to observe those same behaviors in my own interactions with both myself and others. Thus, me, Maddie, and my brother started to understand what we are so we could better negotiate who we are. It's never been telling us what to do, but rather how to do it. They let us make our own choices and promised against their own instincts to let us dig our own graves. When we decided to make the mistakes, it was inevitable we were going to make. Dumb seems to be a prerequisite to being young. But they never buried us. They waited by the ladder, so when we smartened up, they could lend us their hands and hoist us onto their shoulders, a supposed ancestral privilege they never were afforded. Their parents, like most, fell for the psyop pressed upon them. They were given sand foundations. Yet they fostered our desire for knowledge anyway. How? Because in exchange for us listening to them, they listened to us. We were heard, negotiated with, not dismissed all the time. Our dad said, you have the right to make your case, but I have the right to defend mine. And so the navigation of individual relationships took precedence over the labels and offices of mom, dad, sister, daughter, son. And now, here Macy and I stand to help them take that sand and learn how to make glass. For we are sowing the seeds of trees whose shade will not be ours to bask in, but the next generations. We started becoming aware of what was going on in the world through listening to Jordan Peterson in the intellectual dark web. Culturally, my dad started to dip his toes into these great minds that encouraged people like us to become better than who we were yesterday through mottos such as incremental progress. And he began listening to their podcasts to gain more knowledge, which encouraged the rest of us to follow suit um, in the pursuit of self-improvement. The COVID facade began when we went on the news to see what was going on, but we took it with a grain of salt. The people we were listening to, such as Brett Weinstein and Heather Hine from the Dark Horse podcast, were already bringing up good questions about vaccines and how long they should be in trial before coming onto the market. Uh, we did have a photo of a gentleman at the Tim Hortons parking lot holding a sign saying Dr. Astrid Stuckelberger, WHA whistleblower, vax bioweapon to depopulate the earth, see about it on Rumble. Our clan wasn't this privy to, the, privy to the depopulation agenda, but we were silently listening and observing before coming to any finite conclusions on the actual mortality of COVID and if there was any need to panic and rush to get this so-called vaccine. Our mom eventually heard of the truth about COVID-19 by Dr. Mercola from Michaela Peterson's podcast and told our dad to give that a read. He did so promptly because the bioweapon mandates were on their way and between the social pressure and the threat of losing their jobs, two of our clan members were days away from getting it. When our dad finished the book, he didn't tell us what to do. He simply said, do the reading yourselves and make your own decision, but an informed one at that. The pursuit of self-improvement and chasing rabbit holes continued on, as it will for the rest of our lives. And amidst our educational journey, we're hundreds of doctors and physicians, some of here are today. And that led us to the World Council for Health. If you haven't heard of them, go look them up. Through their telegram, our dad saw a poster for an international animation competition, of which he forwarded to me. I submitted my first animation ever, which you do not have the privilege of seeing. <laughs> and I was soon thereafter announced the winner. Through that tiny little video, the WCH manager introduced me to Rain Trozy, son of Mark Trozy, and together we help, um, with help from other youth and mentors, we developed and fostered his vision, I'm only a founding member, not the founder, of Over to the Youth, which brings us to the solutions. To solve the education crisis, we have to inspire people to want to educate themselves. That means getting educated on everything. History, psychology, physics, medicine. 
Specialization has its place, but as the aforementioned Heather Hying once said, we need more generalists. Because you can't unlearn knowledge, and education is potential. It's understanding ourselves, the world around us, and challenging and channeling our ideas with others to solve the exact problems we're trying to solve right now. It's encouraging each other to share what we know, but also to admit what we don't know, and to get better at filling in our unread library effect. If youth are the future, it's vital we meet this call so that when our predecessors are no longer able to hold, hold the fort, we can pick up the swords they so graciously have fought with. Um, and this is how we started our vision for Over to the Youth. <laughs> we know the only way to actuate intentional change is to lead by example. We follow the wisdoms of the generations before us and be the change we wish to see in the world. To embody this, Over to the Youth has become an online support community for courage to confront local problems wherever your HQ may be, because Canada is not the only war front. Maddie and I are here as part of the solution for Canada, as well as some OTTY members in the audience sit here today here to show their support. <laughs> and Rain Trozzi and Tom Shaw from Over to the Youth are acting as part of the solution at the Better Way Conference in Bath, United Kingdom. If you're wanting to get involved through open discussions, challenge your understanding and our own, or simply just want some friends with meaningful values, then we'd love to have you. Because as I always say, more minds are better than one. Go to overtotheyouth.com as you can, well, you can't see on the screen, you were gonna see on the screen. <laughs> you can submit a join form from our site and join our telegram. If you have any questions, please come and talk to us. We only bite when we're hungry. A popular means by which we like to self-educate is reading. I had a bunch of really good books that I've read and I'm in the midst of reading on the screen. We'll just put them on the website so it's all good. Active reading is not only something the youth should be doing, but every generation now and here on out if we want an honest attempt at longevity for an educated populace. Of all the books I have read and listened to in the form of audiobooks, None connected the dots as seamlessly as this one. Luckily, I brought it with me. Let's do a bit of show and tell. Mm -hmm. Matthew 7, 8. At the beginning of our presentation, I consciously asked you to receive me. Albeit that may seem redundant considering we were invited here to speak with you today. I did it anyway. Why? I didn't assume that because you were sitting here looking at me, you must be giving me your undivided attention. That is because I know very well that your attention is in fact divided. Not by the person next to you or the phone you brought with you, but by your very own brain. I learned recently from Danielle Smith that when looking into changing the Alberta curriculum, the teachers were resistant. I've come to understand that we can put all the right infrastructure in place for a new educational system Shorter school hours, curriculums based not upon memorization, but actual, inspired, practical learning. But if the knowledge we are teaching stays stagnant, we will indefinitely perpetuate this dark age. I've come to understand this through reading Master and His Emissary. I asked you all to attend to me consciously because attention is a moral act. What is the point in addressing solutions such as family, faith, freedom, if none of us are in the right mindset to receive it? To attend to something is to give it relevance, meaning, value, in the moment you are attending to it. In our brains, we have two hemispheres, and each hemisphere has their own mode of attention. The left hemisphere mode of attention, if it were engaged, you may have found yourself less open to hearing the things that were presented to you. Whether it was because you were offended or put in an unfamiliar position, thus making you feel uncomfortable, like the teachers unwilling to update the school curriculum because it exposes the unread library effect. If the right hemisphere mode of attention was engaged, you may have found yourself open to the possibilities of whatever came your way. You'd play it out in your brain, weigh out the costs and benefits, ask how it would affect other people as well. You may not have said yes to all the solutions, but you wouldn't have just said no. Both hemispheres are beautiful in their own right, 
but it is like having two people in our heads with two very different values all at the same time, like Smeagol and Gollum from Lord of the Rings. The question is, which mode of attention are you choosing to be in? There is a ratio of which they should be attuned to, but it's not simply 50-50. If there are no other books you will walk away with today than this one, please let it be so. It is an unfathomable success. Because we all have brains, we ought to try and learn them with our best foot forward and this book is that step. Many people have theorized the answer to why would people do these awful things, and often they can only say control. This book goes further than to just explain why that is, but how we've repeated this history and continue to get here. I ask you to receive me. Now I ask you to seek because I know you'll find. And this knock opens doors for open modes of attention. In conclusion, to become educated and self-improve as youth, me and Maddie had a nuclear family. To strive for an educated future populace, the nuclear family must be revitalized to act as a place of support, a place for deep conversations and conscious contention where both parents and children get in the ring together to help map the world and one another. To encourage the pursuit of truth and self-education, parents and youth have to lead by example to allow the next generations to mirror us. This means embodying the curiosity that children are born with to gain new knowledge and exposing yourself to the areas of your life that make you uncomfortable and uncertain. For that is where the right hemisphere mode of attention lies and most knowledge can be found. This will give us a new culture of philosopher kings. Get involved in your local and global communities. You have to submit yourself to the system in order to update it. Have discussions to map out your thought processes and learn to properly articulate them. Understand what you are to better negotiate who you are. Thank you. 